In this video, we'll learn about the non-inverting op-amp configuration. Here you see the non-inverting configuration pictured. We're going to first analyze it, assuming an ideal op-amp. The first difference between the non-inverting and inverting configuration you may notice is that the input source is here connected to the positive input terminal of the op-amp. Remembering that this is an ideal op-amp, we'll recognize that there's zero input current drawn from the source. Therefore, the input resistance of this configuration is the ratio of the input voltage source and input current. And since input current zero, we've got infinite input resistance. This is in contrast to the inverting configuration where the input resistance is determined by one of the resistor values connected in the configuration. Next, let's analyze this configuration to find its gain. The input source still applied here. And remembering that we're assuming an ideal op amp for the time being, we can make use of the virtual short circuit assumption. That's step one, which tells us that the two input terminals must be at the same voltage. Since the positive input terminal is at a voltage VI, we therefore know in step two that the negative op amp input terminal must also be at a voltage VI. Therefore, the voltage across resistor R1 is VI. This allows us to find the current through the resistor R1 equal to the voltage across the resistor divided by the resistance value. That's step three. Now, again, remembering that we have an ideal op amp, step four is to remember that the current to the negative input terminal of the op amp must also be zero. A nodal equation here then reveals that the current through this branch in step five must be equal to the current through R1. That is the current through R2 is equal to VI over R1. This current flowing through R2 gives rise to a voltage drop across it. That's equal to the current V1 over R1 times the resistance R2. Now that voltage appears in series on top of the voltage at this node, which is VI. So the last step is to write the output voltage VO being the sum of VI plus the voltage across the resistor R2. Finally, we rearrange, we group terms uh, as shown here, and then we can rearrange the expression to find the ratio VO over VI, which is the closed loop gain of the configuration, and it's equal to one plus R2 over R1. Again, we note a key difference compared with the inverting configuration, and that is that the gain here is positive. That is, it's not inverting. The second main difference with the inverting configuration was already pointed out on the last slide. The input resistance is very high and ideally infinite. Next, let's reanalyze the non-inverting configuration for an op amp that has a finite gain A, but is otherwise ideal. Since the op amp gain is finite, we have to relax the virtual short circuit assumption. We can no longer assume the two op amp input terminals are at the exact same voltage. Instead, we know that the input differential voltage, VID, is equal to the output voltage VO divided by the op amp gain A. Therefore, we can write the voltage here as being VI minus VID, or VI minus VO over A. This is then the voltage across the resistor R1. Remembering that the op amp is otherwise ideal, there's no current going in here. So the current flowing through R1 is the same current that flows through R2. And that current is equal to the voltage drop across R1, VI minus VO over A divided by 
the resistor value of R1. That current gives rise to a voltage drop across R2. That's equal to this current that's flowing through R1, I1, times R2. Finally, we can write the output voltage in terms of the voltage at the negative op amp terminal, which we said is VI minus VO over A, minus the voltage drop across R2, which is the current flowing through R2, I1, times R2. If we take this expression, group the like terms, and rearrange it, we can write an expression for VO over VI in terms of the resistance values R1 and R2 and the op amp finite gain A. The resulting closed loop gain expression is shown here. Now, it's a little bit more complicated than the expression for the ideal op amp, but we can recognize one key fact, which is that if this term here becomes much less than unity, then the expression will simply be 1 plus R2 over R1, which is the same value that we found when we performed the analysis with infinite op amp gain. That is to say that the closed loop gain of the amplifier will approximate its ideal value as long as the op amp gain A is a lot greater than 1 plus R2 over R1. That is, that it's a lot greater than the gain we're trying to achieve with the non-inverting configuration, which is 1 plus R2 over R1, its ideal gain. Interestingly, this is the exact same criteria that we found in order for the inverting configuration to approximate its ideal value. In fact, that's no coincidence. It stems from the fact that both configurations look the same if we set the input sources to zero. Another way to think of this criteria is to say that if we want to realize a non-inverting configuration with a certain gain, 1 plus R2 over R1, then we need to use an op amp with a gain A that's much greater than that desired gain. Otherwise, the configuration won't behave ideally. Here's an exercise where we analyze a useful circuit, a non-inverting weighted summer, and we get to practice some of the analysis techniques we just learned with the non-inverting configuration. We're going to do the analysis assuming an ideal op amp. And let's do the analysis by superposition. So we're going to analyze the output voltage in terms of each of the input sources one at a time, alternately setting the other to zero. So first, let's set V1 equal to zero. And then that gives rise to the following schematic. I'll just redraw it quickly. So here you'll notice that I've replaced the source V1 with a short circuit because that's what a voltage source with a value of zero volts looks like. So the analysis of this circuit, assuming an ideal op amp is quite simple. Since there's no current flowing into the op amp input terminals, the only current flowing in this branch is flowing this way. So that gives us a straightforward voltage divider. At this node, we see the voltage V2 multiplied by 
1k over 3k plus 1k straight voltage divider. So that's equal to a quarter of V2. From there, we've just got a straightforward non-inverting configuration. We know that the output voltage can be written as 1 plus R2 over R1. In this case, R2 is 7k, R1 is 1k. That's the gain of the non-inverting configuration with an ideal op amp. And that gain is multiplied by the voltage at the positive input terminal of the op amp, which is a quarter of V2. So simplifying, we see that we've got 8 times a quarter or a gain of 2 with respect to V2. So that's the analysis with V1 set equal to 0. Next, let's do the analysis assuming V2 is equal to 0. So this follows very similarly. We redraw the schematic. setting this time V2 equal to zero. So here again is where V2 should be. But since it's equal to zero here, we just replace it with a short circuit. So again, as before, we've got a straightforward voltage divider determining the voltage at the op amp's positive input terminal. In this case, the voltage divider is a ratio of 3 over 4. And that's multiplying V1. The output voltage is 1 plus R2 over R1, 1 plus 7k over 1k in this case, times the op amp positive terminals voltage, 3 quarters V1. So that then is 8 times 3 quarters, or 6 times V1. So that's the analysis. That's the output voltage we get when V2 is set equal to 0. The last step in the superposition analysis is to combine the results from the previous two steps. So. All we've got to do is write that VO is fixed times V1, which we found in step two, plus two times V2, which is what we found in step one. So you see here, it's a weighted summer. You get a weighted summation of the two input voltages, where the relative weighting is being determined by these component values over here. Unlike the weighted summer we saw with the inverting configuration, here the gains are positive. Which can make it useful instead of or in combination with the inverting weighted summer. Finally, let's consider another important op-amp configuration, the voltage follower, shown here. The voltage follower can actually be thought of as a special case of the non-inverting configuration, where resistor R2, which usually appears here in feedback around the resistor, is replaced by a short circuit. So it can be thought of as a resistor with a value of zero. And R1, which would usually appear here, is replaced with an open circuit and can therefore be thought of a resistor with a value of infinity. If we want to complete the analysis this way, we remember that the gain of the inverting configuration is 1 plus R2 over R1. And obviously, the ratio in this case of R2 over R1 is 0. So we've just got a gain of 1. Hence, the output voltage VO is 
simply equal to vi. And you might wonder why this configuration is so useful and so popular if it simply provides a gain of one. After all, we can simply short the input and the output and thereby ensure that the two voltages are equal to each other. But the key point here is that like the non-inverting configuration, like any non-inverting configuration, the input resistance is infinite. So there's no current drawn from the input source, VI. And that's very unlike a short circuit where current can flow from VI to VO. Here, the op amp is providing whatever current is needed at the output voltage VO. So the output voltage simply follows whatever the input voltage is without drawing any current from it. This is very useful as we'll see in the next exercise. So this exercise asks us to consider a transducer having an open circuit voltage of one volt and a source resistance of one mega ohms. So let's draw that using its feminine equivalent. So here's the source one volt, it's got a source resistance of one mega ohm. And it says first in part A, let's consider what happens if we connect that directly to a 1K load. Well, if we do that, what's the resulting voltage across the load, VO? Well, we get this very uh, small voltage divider formed by the ratio of 1K over 1K plus 1 mega ohm, dividing the source voltage 1 volt. So this term here is approximately equal to one one thousandth. So it means we get about a millivolt at the output voltage here. So we've got a source voltage of one volt, but we're only seeing one millivolt across the load. And the reason is because it's got a very large source resistance, RS. This is not uncommon for example, sensors or other transducers that we have to connect to in practice. Now, if we want to extract a full signal from the source, get a value closer to that one volt, we need to insert something in between the source and the load that has a high input resistance. So therefore the voltage divider ratio formed with the one mega ohm source resistance is not too bad. And a low output resistance that uh, ensures we won't have too bad a voltage division ratio at the output. And that's exactly what the voltage follower does. So in part B, let's consider what happens when we insert that voltage follower here between the source and the load. It looks like this. There's our voltage follower. And here's our load. One kilo ohm here. VO. So again, assuming an ideal op amp, there's no current drawn now from the source. So therefore there's no voltage drop across this source resistance. It's one mega ohm source resistance. That means that the voltage here is exactly equal to the source voltage, one volt. The voltage follower provides a gain of one. So we get the full voltage, one volt appearing across the load. The current, which turns out to be one milliamp, that results in the load across the load uh, through the load resistor, one kilo ohm, is provided by the op amp, not the source in this case. And you see we extract the full voltage signal from the source using the source follower. So even though the source follower, the voltage follower provides a gain of only one, we see that compared in a case like this, compared to the case where there's no voltage follower used, we actually get an increase in gain of a thousand. So you can think of the voltage follower as providing an effective increase in gain of a thousand in this case. Finally, let's analyze the voltage follower 
assuming an op amp that's ideal except for a finite gain A. So as before, we have to relax our virtual short circuit assumption at the input and recognize that the differential input voltage is equal to the output voltage over the gain A. That means that the voltage at this terminal is equal to the voltage at the positive op amp terminal, VI, minus the differential voltage VID, which is VO over A. Now, the way the configuration is connected, that voltage is identically equal to the output voltage VO. So we've already got our expression that relates VO, VI, and the up amp gain A. We simply need to rearrange this to find the actual closed loop gain, VO over VI, which in this case is one over one plus one over A. So we see here that this will approximate the ideal gain of the voltage follower one, as long as the op amp gain A is a lot greater than unity. So again, this is a special case, the non-averting configuration. As with the non-averting configuration, we see that it behaves ideally as long as the op amp gain A is a lot bigger than the desired ideal close of gain that we're trying to achieve, which in this case is one. This suggests that the op amp doesn't really need a lot of gain in order for it to be used in a voltage follower configuration and behave almost ideally.